park yourself right there. It's time for architecture, coffee, and ink. Hello, this is Hollywood C, and you're listening to Architecture, Coffee, and Ink, a podcast dedicated to introducing concepts, detailing out designs, and tackling the architecture you might not realize the meaning behind. I'm your hostess, and I am here today to start introducing you to the designs that make you wonder why. So I ask you to brew your coffee, grab your sketchbook and pen, and let's begin. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode. I have been snowed in all weekend and looking at pictures of Central Parks in the summertime while researching this episode. And I don't know about everyone else, but I miss the summer so much right now. Instead, I will just have to live vicariously through the episode and photos, I guess. We are going to spend today's episode on Central Park talking through the entire history, design, and renovations, and basically finishing up this topic altogether. And I say finishing up, but truthfully, this is the bulk of the story, whereas in part one, I focused exclusively on providing the backgrounds and histories for the three major players behind the story, Andrew Jackson Downing, Robert Vox, and Frederick Law Olmsted. I do want to reissue my warning from the last episode, as honestly it applies more to the topics we're going to discuss today. A lot of primary sources from this time printed propaganda, misinformation, and smear campaigns. I am super against that. This podcast again celebrates all the people and cultures we discuss. I don't link to any sources that support that, but if you research the topic further, please be aware it's out there. Remember, as always, to always check your sources, check your facts, and most importantly, check me. Going back to the introduction from the previous episode, I mentioned how due to a rapidly increasing population, New York City was struggling with having a booming population and nowhere for them to go. Prior to the park, pretty much the only option at this point to experience nature within the city itself was to go to cemeteries. And this idea was not new or exclusive to New York, But at the same time, Europe, Paris and London in particular, had the ability to go to a park, picnic, and frolic, and not hang out next to great aunt Genevieve and feel guilty about not paying their respects. Admittedly, this was predominantly the wealthy and elite, and we will see how that trend repeats throughout the park's history. One of the most challenging aspects of creating a park was based on the limitations imposed by the previous city planning. At this point in time, New York was operating on a grid system established in 1811. This plan was the Commissioner's Plan of 1811 and was the plan responsible for shifting New York City into the city grid it is now. And some relics of this survey can actually be found throughout the city. The only thing was that this plan really failed to include a park that was within the scope the city leaders were considering at this time. What was included was smaller ones which meant limited access. From the very start of the project, they wanted to make a park that would become a destination and really put New York City on the map. But the original problem was where to put it. So at first, they were planning on seizing the land of a wealthy upper-class neighborhood, Jones Woods. The wealthy had managed to block the acquisition of their lands through an injunction. They basically got the government to declare the action unconstitutional and so the city decided to look elsewhere for their park. After the second attempt to acquire Jones Woods failed, in 1853, the New York State Legislature landed on a total of 750 acres. This would span from 59 to 106th Street in modern-day New York City and was later on extended to 110th in 1863. And they realized that placing a park towards the middle might be more beneficial given that the area that they were considering was on swampy rural land and would be unsuitable for any future residential construction. The issue was people were already living there, though if you read the newspapers from that time, they falsely claim it was home to squatters and vagabonds, but it was actually a total of 1,600 people who were displaced and the 
one town that got the brunt of the slander and also had the highest population density was Seneca Village. While in reality, it was an extremely well-organized community of middle-class landowners. Though it was not the only community there, it was lost to history until a work by Rosenwig and Blackmar in 1992 brought the community back to the modern public eye. This land was seized through eminent domain, which is a rule that means that the government has the right to seize private property and use it for the public. However, the previous owners do have to be fairly compensated, which we're going to discuss after I share some of the history of this village. Seneca Village existed from 1825 to 1857 and was located from West 82nd to West 89th Street in modern-day New York City in the park. The town's population was predominantly African Americans with later addition of Irish and German immigrants. It was the first free community established in New York State and was essential as having land and being a property owner was required to be able to vote according to a law passed at that time. This law was that they could only vote if they had $250 in property and was established in 1821. There were a couple of moral requirements, but the residents in the village were actually responsible for the majority of the votes in the state after the village was established. At its peak, it would have had around three cemeteries, two schools, and three churches. A self-sufficient community, it was also an escape from the ongoing racism that was running rampant in NYC. Currently, no one is really sure where the name Seneca came from. But there are multiple suggested theories and several scholars and organizations devoted to learning more and attempting to locate descendants. They are using the 1850 federal census to help them locate the family. Of course, it is suspected that this town was also either a stop or a destination on the Underground Railroad, according to several expert interviews I listened to. For my international listeners, this was the network in the past used to smuggle slaves into free state and to freedom, which means that it is very unlikely for us to find any written records of them there. However, it included Summit Rock and can be found on maps including ones from 1838 and 1856. The town was first established by Andrew Williams, who purchased three lots from a man named John Whitehead. Williams was 25 years old and purchased them for $125. Later, Later that same day, another member of a group he was in, called the New York Society for Mutual Relief, purchased another 12 lot for $578 and it continued to spread from there. There was originally a second development around York Hill, however they ended up creating the Crowton Reserve and the families ended up resettling in Seneca Village instead. By 1855, it would have been around 52 houses, all from one to three stories tall. Additionally, there were several other smaller communities, including Pigtown, named for the livestock kept, and a few others. A bone processing plant, Harsville, and more. Politicians in the paper ran smear campaigns, and the government offered less than the market value for the price of the community until the village and the surroundings were owned by them. Andrew Williams was one of the last to hold out until he finally accepted the money and left. The town and all of the homes were then destroyed and the city and way of life demolished. While they have been able to locate William's descendants, the same cannot be said for all of the previous residents. Ongoing efforts are being made to study the town, find the families, and reclaim the lost history. If you're interested in reading more, there have been several studies and excavations and you can read out those reports online. Frederick Law Olmsted became the superintendent of Central Park in 1857. As I mentioned in the last episode, Calvert Fox had taken up the cause after Andrew Jackson Downing's death and had been helping and encouraging a competition to be arranged to pick a design for Central Park. Olmsted and Vox had met each other through Downing, and Vox asked Olmsted to join him in preparing an entry. They were the winning design chosen from a total of 32 plans. The Central Park website has a few of them uploaded and I've seen a couple of others and while I do have a problem with one of the people who helped arrange the competition winning the competition, I would say that the Green Words plan was definitely the most realistic and fleshed out plan when it was announced as the winner in 1858. They were given a set of requirements, and I'm just going to quote the full list from the Central Park website for this. They needed to have an observatory, flower garden, parade ground, drive, two ball fields, music hall, 
four roads transversing the park and winter skating grounds all coming in under 1.5 million dollars given that it took over 15 years for central park to be completed we can already cross off coming in under budget off the list of the plan's accomplishments but at the time of the proposal the plan had undoubtedly the best experience intended for any future park goer and let's go through some of the intricacies of the plan despite not having designed a green space prior to this, Olmsted had an extremely firm set of beliefs about how green spaces should work, and as I mentioned in the last episode, that was due in no small part to the parks he experienced while on a trip to Europe and due to his friendship with Downing and Box. Olmsted firmly believed that green space should be accessible to all citizens and should remain strictly divided from the private, meaning unlike previous grounds and garden, it should be separate from private residents. He would spend a lot of his time while working for the park continuing to defend that belief. Like all of his designs, and all his designs with Vox, the plan focused on enhancing natural features, though it would be more fitting to say man-made natural features in the pastoral and picturesque styles. One of the most pivotal aspects of this plan is that the four required roads are actually sunken into the landscape, meaning that while you are walking through the park, your view is completely unobstructed by the hustle and bustle of mundane life. Although this was huge compared to even designs like Versailles, which were extremely structured designs full of highly controlled geometry, geometric patterns, even the water elements were designed to be amorphous. The entire plan was designed to reflect the complex relationship between nature and man, a topic that has been reflected in numerous writings over the years. Construction occurred during the financial panic of 1857, which already wasn't a great start from the project. Tag in the American Civil War starting and finishing well within the park's initial construction, and yeah, I can't imagine anyone listening now is surprised that it was longer, harder, and more expensive than anticipated to build. They moved a total of 5 million cubic feet of debris and 36 arches by Vox, 6 man-made bodies of water as the reservoirs on the site actually became what is now the Great Lawn in modern day New York. Vox and Homestead also used circular paths to help with controlling movement through the park and of course everyone's favorite trivia they used more gunpowder to construct Central Park than they used in the entire Battle of Gettysburg. The single battle in the American Civil War that both turned the tide of the war and held the highest number of casualties. Additionally, they planted some 500,000 plants and the entire landscape is man-made. Eleven overpasses were built over the transverse sunken roads and the first section debuted in 1858, although the park cost 14 million dollars. Since the park open, there has been an ongoing struggle to meet evolving social and economic needs while upholding the original plan. Originally, there was a lot of restriction on the park goers and a lot of rules that excluded the general public and pretty much guaranteed would only ever be used by the elite. There were a lot of rules against recreational activities and a lot of conflicts about intention. One of the reoccurring issues that would continue to pop up throughout the park's history is how much should we focus on the original design. The ongoing Central Park Commission wanted the park to be an epicenter of education and culture, but Olmsted and Vox's original plans were focused on integrating the architecture and the landscape together something that the commission's plans would have gone directly against. They ended up going back and forth until they finally compromised and built two buildings on the very edge of the boundaries, the American Museum of Natural History and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, for which they would actually end up asking Vox and someone named Jacob Ray Mould to design in Victorian Gothic. Later additions after that included the Central Park Zoo in 1871, at which point we see the park slowly become a victim of history. America experienced the Great Depression in the 1930s after the Wall Street crash of 1929. The park fell into a dramatic decline as maintenance and funding got funneled away from the park and focused on living conditions and more immediate need. This continued until 1933 when Mayor LaGuardia created a post titled the Park 
commissioner and appointed a man named Robert Moses to the position. Moses would revitalize and bring new life into the park and into the city as a whole. Unfortunately, he would also do things like deliberately design a parkway with bridges too low for buses to prevent those who couldn't afford a car from being able to use them. So I would hold off your applause, but he did completely change the landscape and implement a series of changes, including some 20 playgrounds, the carousel, multiple sculptures, including the Alice in Wonderland. He also provided 30,000 to 60,000 jobs, demolished the casino, which was also designed by Vogue, and continued to influence later generations of the park commissioners. It was in the 60s, after Moses left on May 23rd, 1960, that we saw the introduction of multiple cultural events, some of which we continue to this day. However, they declined or halted in the 70s after another crisis called massive lapses of maintenance. It is at this point that Central Park starts to really be associated with the less savory aspects of life. Crime and drug activities ramp up within the park dramatically, and it is basically left this way until the establishment of the Central Park Conservancy, the very same agency that runs the park today. While they have altogether invested around 1 billion into the current 843 acres, in their initial mission, they focused on restoring the park and really trying to refocus the park on the original plans. To put it mildly, Olmsted and Vox probably wouldn't have been fond of some of the changes made and the dilapidated conditions the park had fallen into, so a strong effort was made to return to the original intention of the park, and this lasted until the 1990s when it was pretty much restored. The areas included were the Dairy, Bethesda Mountain, and Sheep's Meadow. Wrapping up a couple of important dates, the park was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1963 and a New York State scenic landmark in 1974. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1966. Today, the park is home to more than 18,000 trees, countless wildlife, and crime life. The park has been part of countless Law and Order episodes, as well as having several extremely infamous crimes, including the Central Park Five. It is all over popular culture in multiple movies and TV series. Series. It is also pivotal to the Atlantic Flyway and used by a total of 200 species of birds. Today, the park has a projected total of 42 million visitors annually, often from all over the world, making it the world-class destination that the original city leaders always wanted. But beyond that, groups are making efforts to reclaim the lost history and those who have been connected to the park at various points in their lives. Studies excavations, and renovations opening, all happening in America's first fully landscaped, fully man-made park. It provides an oasis from the hustle and bustle of the city life for both visitor and resident alike. Thank you once again. As always, please rate, review, and subscribe everywhere you get your podcasts from. We are on iHeartRadio. I am currently putting this on YouTube Podcast, Apple, Spotify, and more. You can find me on Instagram at Architecture Coffee and Inc. Join the Facebook group, email the show at Architecture Coffee and Inc. at gmail.com or the blog at Architecture Coffee and Inc.com. Architecture Coffee and Inc. is a Hollywood C Studios LLC production. And I am excited to meet with all my designers, dreamers, DIY enthusiasts next time. But in the meantime, may your coffee mugs be full and your ink wells never run dry.